Hello everyone and welcome to this course on Embedded Linux and FPGAs. I am Nitin Chandrachudan and this course is sort of a follow-up to multiple previous courses that most of you would have done as part of the uh, BS in Electronic Systems from IIT Madras. So I'm going to start off by with a brief overview. So in other words, this uh, video over here is just a sort of overview of what you can expect to get from the course and to try and set it in the context of the courses that you have already completed, right? Uh, the overall goals, I'm briefly going to sort of mention it over here, but then I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail by putting it in context in the coming slides. Uh, to summarize it, it would be something like this. The primary goals of this course would be number one, to understand what memory mapped IO looks like and in particular, how does it work in the context of a bus interface such as the AXI light register based interface. Uh, along the way or rather uh, along with this, we will also be learning some essential aspects of the Linux kernel, in particular focusing on concepts involving device drivers. Now this is something I want to emphasize over here. In general, a complete course on operating systems is by itself a one semester long course. So what we will be covering over here will be just a very small aspect of the overall uh, set of topics that are involved in operating systems. Primarily only enough to sort of understand what the relationship between a piece of hardware and the corresponding software interface, which we usually call the device driver, consists of. Right? Uh, please keep in mind that this will not be sufficient for you to even learn how, for example, a new system boots up from scratch. It's primarily meant to sort of focus on the parts of the operating system that deal with interfacing with an external peripheral. And in general, in order to really get the most out of this course, it would be strongly advisable to also do a more detailed course that goes into depth in operating systems. Okay. Uh, now, as part of this, right, as part of this process of looking at how a hardware peripheral interacts with the software, which is the operating system kernel by means of device drivers. We will be taking up examples that we'll be implementing on FPGA hardware and looking at how we can integrate that hardware into the Linux kernel via this concept of what's called a device tree entry. Okay. And in the process, we will be taking up a running example and sort of working through this to try and get the complete hardware software integration along with other sort of performance enhancements such as the use of interrupts. Now, one word of caution over here, this word hardware software integration and hardware software partitioning are used in multiple different contexts. In particular, some of you may have come across it in the context of how we can get high performance uh, processing by means of appropriately partitioning a computation operation between a CPU and some custom hardware that we are writing. That is related at some level to what we are trying to do in the sense that all those kind of peripherals where we have a custom hardware peripheral that is then being interfaced with a piece of software also needs to go through the process of you know having a device driver and integrating with the kernel and then having a software interface that can be used for programming it. But how to go about doing that partitioning in an optimal way and how to get high performance is not the goal of this course, right? We are going to focus primarily only on how exactly the driver allows the hardware to interact with the software and what are the issues that come up when we try to build such a system together. Okay. So the prerequisites for this course primarily consist of these two courses, the embedded C programming course and the digital system design course. In embedded C, just to sort of you know, do a lightning summary of what the course was about. We looked at various concepts, primarily involving pointers, device registers, and how to go about configuring different peripherals. We also introduced this notion of memory mapped IO and how we could basically have the overall address space corresponding to a processor being divided up into different segments and being used for either memory or custom peripherals. In the digital system design course, we went up to the point where we basically built up a simple CPU and looked at its instruction set. How can the instruction set be created? How does it uh, 
encode the various different kinds of functionalities that are required from the CPU and so on. And in the process, we basically sort of reviewed various things such as combinational and sequential circuits, finite state machines, all of which are essential for this idea of creating a data path with control that can then in turn interface with a software based system, right. So these two courses are sort of essential prerequisites for this current course, which is embedded Linux and FPGAs, right. And uh, there will be a number of uh, cases where I will be drawing on, you know, direct references to uh, material that was already covered in those courses. So please ensure that, you know, you are comfortable with the content of those before proceeding. Now, all of this sort of leads us to the question of why do we need such a complicated setup? In other words, why do I have this thing where, you know, I'm creating hardware and then going and trying to interface it with software and I have to write a device driver, I have to write an operating system kernel interface, all kinds of seemingly complicated things. The bottom line is what we consider as modern digital systems, right? are in general too complex for a pure hardware implementation, right? Even something as simple as let's say a timer, which maybe is used for maybe just a countdown timer for something like a microwave oven or something like that, right? All that it needs to do is pretty much you set a countdown and then it sort of counts all the way down and then it triggers a uh, bell or some kind of sound that goes off at the end of it waits for the door to be opened and depending on what happens next, it has to change its functionality. Now you could write all of that completely in software because it's slow enough. But what happens if you want something that needs to work a little bit faster? You could potentially implement it in hardware. You could also go for a complete hardware implementation, right? Which means that all of these different states has the counter actually counted down have I sort of pulled open the door and interrupted the counting process? Has the counter started, has it reached the end point and therefore triggered off whatever the bell that needs to be rung at the end? While the bell is ringing, what happens if I open the door? What happens if I press the reset button at some point? The moment I start bringing in all these different functionalities, you find that a pure hardware implementation starts to get extremely complicated, right? Because at the end of the day, the only way that you can really implement some kind of complicated interface processing in hardware is using some kind of finite state machine and the more number of states and the more number of transitions that you introduce over there, the harder it becomes both to code and to debug. So usually what we do is we try to sort of split the uh, complexity, right? The parts that are required to have computations, in other words, things like, you know, multiplying large numbers, uh, perhaps doing dot product across vectors, finding out uh, the distance between a pair of vectors or some other kind of computations, which is essentially largely numerical, but is also a very fixed kind of computation that's perfectly handled by hardware, right? That's exactly what data paths are good at. Now, if I wanted to do a lot of other functionality, I would need complicated control in the hardware. So rather than putting all that control logic into the hardware, what we say is, let me make the control part of it something that could be programmed and push that into the software. So by having this interface between high performance computing, which happens, which is controlled by the hardware and very flexible control, which can be implemented in software, we get a good sort of division of labor and the hardware software interface allows us to get a very efficient solution to whatever problem we are trying to solve. This course is primarily looking at systems like that, where there is a requirement both for a decent amount of computational throughput and at the same time flexibility in terms of the performance or the type of control logic that needs to be implemented, right? The example that we will take might look very simple from that point of view. It is primarily going to involve some kind of timer and, you know, some things of that sort, but that's primarily because it is meant as an educational exercise. The same principles, as you can imagine, extend to fairly complicated devices, right? An example of that, if you think about it ultimately, is something like a GPU, a graphics processing unit, right? Most of you today probably just think of a GPU as a processor that needs to be programmed in software. But if you think about it from the point of view of the hardware designer, 
Now the hardware designer needs to sort of take certain decisions. What parts of the control logic need to be implemented in hardware? The hardware designer needs to take certain decisions in terms of how exactly the implementation of the GPU needs to be done. What parts of the computation need to be done completely in hardware? For example, should an image recognition task be implemented directly in hardware or do you just provide certain kinds of primitives based on which software could be written that could actually perform vector multiplications, matrix multiplications and so on and thereby we could implement arbitrarily complex functionality. Right? So the GPU is a piece of hardware, it has its own device drivers, it needs to interface with the underlying operating system and provide application interfaces that the user can implement. Now, as far as this course is concerned, we will be introducing the basic concepts involved in going all the way up to a GPU. But on the other hand, our focus is going to be on relatively low end computations because we are looking at it primarily from the point of view of explaining the concepts involved. Now, how exactly is all of this done, right? One of the core ideas that enables this interface between hardware and software is the notion of a bus and we talked about this a little bit in the digital systems design course. We have various kinds of bus based architectures and one of the things that I will be focusing on is the so called AXI bus which is commonly used by all ARM processor based systems. It turns out that AXI has also been sort of taken up as a standard by uh, Xilinx which is now part of AMD and is also supported by Altera, uh, the two major uh, FPGA uh, vendors. And the idea is that they sort of provide software support where you can create peripherals that are compatible with the AXI standard, right? And so understanding how a bus works, how it interfaces, how it enables the interface between software and hardware is going to be a crucial part of understanding exactly how such systems get implemented. We also need to have a clear picture of memory mapped IO. We have already discussed it in multiple contexts, first in the embedded C uh, programming course and further also in digital systems design. And of course, now we are going to be looking at it in more detail in terms of how do we construct the right kinds of registers and so on. And finally, the part which has not been touched upon uh, in the previous courses or at least very briefly in terms of the idea of a device driver was mentioned in embedded C. But over here, we will be looking in a lot more detail into what device drivers are and how they implement the uh, interface to the operating system. So at a very high level, the course outline consists pretty much of two parts, right? In the first, the hardware interface, we will be talking about the idea of how registers are used for providing programmability, the AXI light bus, memory mapped IO and then going deeper into the software interface where we will be talking a little bit about the concepts involved in the Linux kernel, how you can write kernel modules, what is meant by the device tree, what drivers are and in general looking at higher performance implementations. So the software interface will actually involve quite a large part of the content of this course. Right? Once again, I would like to repeat, even though we are talking about Linux concepts and kernel modules and so on, we will not be looking at aspects of the kernel such as resource management and uh, scheduling and various other kinds of things that are essential to getting a good operating system. Our focus is going to be entirely on the device drivers and how to interface with hardware. So just to repeat that, right? in particular, be clear that we will not be looking at advanced drivers, uh, different kinds of buses. What I mean by this is the focus over here is primarily going to be around AXI Lite. The full AXI bus will be brought in only when required and sort of, you know, in order to explain certain specific concepts. The reason is there are a lot more signals and a lot more different, uh, a lot different uh, variants of how the buses are used that can be difficult to appreciate and will make the course very rushed if we try to bring all of it in at one shot. Similarly, things like how do we interface PCI peripherals? This by itself is a fairly complicated bus interface and sort of goes beyond the scope of what we can look at. However, the ideas remain the same. It's most of the optimizations and implementations that you find in PCI and USB and so on are primarily around the idea of 
performance optimizations and not necessarily basic core functionality differences. On the same topic, right, high performance considerations, we'll just have an overview of concepts like DMA and interrupts and will not be going too deep into how we can actually go for extremely high throughput systems, right. Time permitting, we will of course look at various aspects of what is involved in those, but not really going into code or hardware examples for that. Similarly, we will also not be uh, diving very deep into operating systems concepts. We will not, for example, be looking at how a system boots, although having a rough idea of it would be useful, right? And we'll just be talking about the bare minimum required to understand the booting process. But the exact uh, set of steps that are involved in booting and, you know, what, how do you go about writing the first stage bootloader as it's called, we will not be getting into in any amount of detail. And similarly, resource and memory management, scheduling, other aspects of operating systems that make them complicated or rather which are essential for a good operating system will just be sort of mentioned but not really uh, discussed in any amount of detail in this course. So it focuses on concepts at a fairly high level and doing a full operating systems course would be quite useful in terms of supplementing the knowledge that you have here. However, if you are looking at it purely from the point of view of how do I get a piece of hardware to interface with the software uh, that is available to me, this will hopefully give you enough of an idea of what are all the challenges that you need to overcome. Uh, there are a few, uh, a couple of books that I can uh, mention that are available as references and of course throughout we will be making sort of additional references, primarily online links and so on available as part of the course material. Uh, this book, Linux Device Drivers, is a relatively old book. It in fact deals with a fairly old version of the Linux kernel. But having said that, it is still a very good reference because a lot of the core underlying concepts of how modules work and so on are already covered as part of this uh, book. Right? Uh, there is also an interesting book which is actually a free download which has been developed jointly between Xilinx and the University of Strathclyde which talks about exploring the Zinc multiprocessing system on chip. Right? And this is basically a full-blown FPGA with an ARM processor on it. And it uses this software called Pink. Um, from the Digital Systems Design Lab, you would be familiar with where how Pink can be used. It basically allows you to have an interface between Python code and the uh, hardware that is being implemented. Right? Over there, of course, we were looking primarily at code that was already written and not really going deep into how it worked. Uh, this book has a lot of useful information in terms of how, what kind of different applications can be uh, built up over here. But once again, what we will be doing in this course, hopefully by the end of it, you should have a good understanding of how Pink works behind the scenes in the sense that how does it allow you to communicate with the hardware peripherals that are available. Apart from that, the Linux kernel documentation and the Xilinx wiki, which gives a lot more information about the background of the system, are useful online references, right? But again, are very generic references. The individual things that are required for each module will be sort of uh, more material will be provided as we go through the system. 